Welcome everyone. We're going to get started here with a sponsor video. Effectively managing nutrients from animal manure serves the environment well and provides economic opportunities for producers. The Trident system is based on a modular design and is fully scalable, offering a nutrient recovery solution for your dairy. The system can be designed to work with digested or raw manure on flush and scraped dairies with sand or fiber bedded barns. Trident is your trusted partner for sustainability and operational performance. Let's look at the process. Whether or not an anaerobic digester is in place, the first step in the process is conditioning the manure. The material is fed to the Trident rotary screen conditioner. This technology conditions the manure by extracting clean coarse fiber for conversion into recycled bedding. The Trident screw press dewaters the coarse fiber to a targeted 30 to 40 percent dry matter. This material is ready for reuse in the barn as dry bedding material. The fine solids in the remaining effluent are sent to the Trident DAF tank. Before entering the DAF, the polymer hydration unit readies the polymer for use in the tank. The polymerized effluent is processed in the DAF tank, creating a nutrient-rich sludge containing the valuable N, P, and K. The Trident MD Press processes the DAF sludge into a dewatered nutrient cake. The volume of this material is now reduced by 80%. That makes it much easier to land apply, transport, and store, or it could be further processed by granulization. The Trident technology is fully scalable. A system can be designed and built to handle a dairy operation with as few as 250 cows, and we have successfully implemented equipment on operations with in excess of 15,000 cows. So what is the result? Well, it's not manure anymore. Once the manure has been treated with the Trident Nutrient Recovery System, it is processed into three valuable co-products. The recovered coarse fibers are excellent bedding material. The fiber production covers 100% of the farm's bedding requirements. The nutrient depleted liquid, the tea water, has less than 1.5% solids content. This is ideal for pivot irrigation or operational flush water. The Trident Nutrient Recovery System captures a high percentage of the feedstock's nutrients. The nutrient cake is ideal for land application or further granulization. These three valuable components have become an asset that has changed the way you can do business. If you'd like to know more about how the numbers crunch out on your farm, please call us. We have an excellent ROI calculator that will give you a clear picture of how a Trident Nutrient Recovery System will make sense in your operation. Welcome back to track two of the 2021 Midwest Manure Summit. My name is Lissa Seafelt. I'm the agriculture uh, educator with Extension in Eau Claire County, and I'll be your host for this track. We'd like to again thank our sponsor for this session, Trident. I would like to introduce our last speaker for track two, uh, Dr. Aaron Cordes. Aaron joined the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystem Engineering at the University of Minnesota in August of 2017. Her position as assistant professor and extension engineer is uh, to provide engineering expertise in the area of sustainable animal air culture systems. Erin was born and raised in Saskatchewan, Canada, and she earned her Bachelor of Agricultural and Bioresource Engineering degree and PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Cordes also has eight years of experience in a similar research and extension role at South Dakota State University. Her past and ongoing projects include measuring air quality impacts of different manure management practices in swine, poultry, dairy, and beef cattle barns, and the impacts of providing additional microenvironment control for grow finished pigs and cattle. The broad mission of Dr. Cordes's program is to work with producers and communities to understand and continually improve the quality and productivity of livestock environments. Uh, Dr. Cordes will be presenting on addressing manure odors at the source. And once again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Trident. With that, Dr. Cordes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lissa. I appreciate the introduction. 
And I appreciate everybody being here this afternoon to, to learn and discuss more about um, manure odors. It's not always the funnest topic uh, to cover and to, and to discuss, but it's an important one nonetheless. Egg air quality is a big concern um, on many levels and for many reasons. This integrated web of potential impacts and solutions encompasses workers, animals, environment and surrounding communities. And really it's this integrated web that drew me into this field way back as an undergrad engineering student. Uh, since that time, which has been a while now, um, you know, time has passed, rules have ebbed and flowed at, at times, new technologies have been developed, but egg air quality remains a big concern. What I wanted to do today is provide a brief high level view of how uh, egg air quality can be both evaluated and mitigated and then go through some um, more techniques as far as addressing manure at the source. So gases, um, gases, particulate matter, and odor are, are three different ways, uh, three different components we can evaluate in the air. The topic of the presentation today is odor get evaluating, or excuse me, addressing manure odors at the source. But I think we need to take gases and particulate matter in tandem with, the, with odor. Gases have a distinct chemical makeup we can detect a mass or a volume of a given of a specific gas in the air as a concentration. Particulate matter includes various types of airborne particles, uh, which we normally classify by size or typically classify by size. Larger particulate matter can affect visibility and aesthetics, but it's really the smaller particles uh, that aren't visible to the human eye that are, are really worrying from a health perspective. We have instruments to measure particulate matter or the mass of part particles in the air. Uh, we also need to recognize that particulate matter can be a carrier for gases or odors or other, or other pathogens for that matter. Odor is a sensation. Odor is a reaction to a combination of odorants in the air. Every human has a different reaction to the same odor, making odor a very challenging measurement. And so while the focus today is on, on manure odors, if we look at both gases and particulate matter at the same time, I think we get a little bit more holistic picture of um, what is happening and what we're doing to try to improve air quality. I wanna give us a common starting point for the conversation today. Um, some of this is based on my assumptions of, of my audience here today, um, but also because I, we want to have a common starting point. First of all, I think we want to recognize that odor is sensed, right? Um, we have, we can measure gases and particulate matter, but odor is sensed. Uh, in very general terms, I think if we're trying to improve air quality, we're, we're generally um, trying to make an improvement across all three odors, gases and um, particulate matter, but the impacts on those three things might be slightly different. Manure is the source of most, but not all, odor associated with livestock production. So we're, we are going to really focus on the manure today, um, recognizing it's important, but not the end all be all source of odor. The third common point, starting point for the conversation today is that how much is too much is a very um, tricky question when it comes to air quality. We do have some rules in some cases, some regulations for some specific gases, and in some cases, some uh, odor impact setbacks in some areas of the country. But really, how much is too much is, I feel, a local decision. And so we're going to talk about it from a mitigation standpoint, but we're not uh, necessarily looking at um, which one, uh, which technique or which approach is most appropriate in every situation. So today what we're going to do is understand the steps to air emission management and then understand considerations for different emission control approaches. I'm going to provide some approach, uh, excuse me, I'm going to provide some resources for a deeper dive into options um, if you so choose to follow into the, look into those. Air emissions management can be forced or voluntary. When it comes to air emissions management, we, as mentioned, have gases, we have particulate matter, and, and some of these, uh, or combinations thereof, may be odorous. Really, common sense and careful siting before an operation 
is even constructed is key, but we're often left with trying to manage it after an operation is up and building, up and operating, excuse me. So we want to consider a systems approach when it comes to air emissions management, where we have manure, but we might have manure at several places. We might have an operation that is spread over a wide area and encompasses more than just manure. We need to consider the whole operation and recognize that as we make changes in our manure management system, for example, there might be consequences elsewhere in the system. Uh, that's going to become, uh, this concept is going to play out when I present the manure spectrum later on. Um, this systems approach and just this stand back approach and looking at the whole system can help us prioritize sources to mitigate. The first step in air emissions management is to identify air emission sources. The three typical sources um, are the housing, the storage and the land application. Each source has some different potential pollutants, but um, they also all encompass manure and manure management. A large proportion of complaints at least historically have been documented from the land application side of things, side, side of things, but um, we're going to try and look at it from a manure perspective. There are many, many different potential sources of emissions, not just for odors, but for PM and gases as well. Um, but manure is the primary contributor to a lot of these. We need to recognize that when we talk about manure as the, um, as a primary emission source, uh, it also encompasses some of the different practices that we need to do on a farm to manage that manure. And it might not just be solely the urine and the feces that are, that are within that manure, it can also include some wash water, for example. For airborne emission management, step two is identifying receptors and assessing location. So identifying the percent, uh, potential receptors, including where manure is applied um, we're not talking just about the workers and the animals in the barns. We're also talking about persons around the operation or public, uh, public buildings or roads. What is the frequency of exposure for these different receptors? We have, uh, or you can uh, obtain wind roses that show wind speed and direction frequencies for, um, for weather stations across the country. It might show that an area is uh, frequently in the path, but the people in the area may change. When we talk about odor, when we talk about air quality, we also need to keep in mind that some people um, smell with their eyes and that sight lines are very important when it comes to air quality management, even though we're not actually sensing, we're not seeing uh, necessarily air quality with our eyes, our vision and uh, perceptions of manure management do play into our, um, into air quality and air quality mitigation. A question I'm often asked is what are the, the health impacts of air quality in animal feeding operations? Uh, there are, there's a two systematic reviews that I've um, frequently gone back to and they, they, they go back and try to update these um, semi-regularly. Uh, I felt, I feel that this systematic review pulls a lot of different research projects together and provides a, a very, um, provides a summary of what those health impacts are from animal feeding operations. And we are talking about the communities around operations. Uh, and as you can see, based on the, the results, they are primarily air quality based or the results and the impacts are primarily related to air quality or perceived air quality. There are various physiological and psychological symptoms reported in the various studies, but through this systematic study, what they've found, um, what the authors have found in the systematic study is that there is a weak and inconsistent association between self-reported disease and people with allergies or familial history of allergies. Um, but there's no consistent dose response relationship between clinical health incomes, outcomes, excuse me, and proximity to livestock operations. There is a result there related specifically to goat production, but I'm not sure it has a lot of bearing in the conversation today. So with airborne emission management, once we've identified the sources and the potential receptors, it's about then assessing what those emissions are, um, putting, trying to put some more quantification to what it is that, um, what it is that is coming from our farm and what it is that is potentially affecting these um, downstream, downstream receptors. It's important to use all our senses 
and we have various tools at our disposal. We, we do have measurement devices, um, particularly uh, with uh, your nearby land grant institution or extension specialist. They might have some personal monitors. They might have some other tools or lab sampling techniques available. Um, but there's other ways that we can look at assessing airborne emissions. We do need to keep in mind whatever it is we're doing, whether it's with measurements or with assessment tools, that airborne emissions are dynamic and they're affected by management decisions, climate, as well as building changes over time. One uh, emission management tool um, that is at our disposal is the National Air Quality Site Assessment Tool. And this is something that's been adopted by the uh, NRCS. It is a qualitative assessment, but does give us site-specific analysis and considers multiple pollutants at the same time. It's an assessment tool and it's really more of a starting point or an estimation tool to look at what is going on within a system and what are those potential pollutants and what is being done for them. It is a survey format and encompasses a lot of different um, animal types or animal species. And it uses, as I said, a survey format so that as you click through and, and put in different factors related to animals or housing, for example, it helps um, draw then to, um, excuse me, some final final results as to where, where the, the farm sits in terms of overall air emissions management. So as you can gather, it is more of a um, computer-based tool um, that can accompany um, what you can sense around a facility. Now, part of our challenge with um, livestock systems is that we really generally have an N of one. And what I mean there is that we really have only the one system to evaluate. And it's very hard then to evaluate or compare when you make different choices in management or housing. And so this is a type of tool that lets you look around among um, different types of systems or different management options that may or may not be possible. Specific to odor, there are some odor estimation tools that estimate the distances and frequencies of odor annoyance around a farm. This is a, an example, a summary of several of those that are out there. South Dakota Odor Footprint Tool, Nebraska Odor Footprint Tool, Offset, um, which is a, for Minnesota or designed for Minnesota. And then the, there's also one from Purdue uh, in this particular list. With these different estimation tools, again, computer-based estimations, it, they consider species and what is the main emitting areas for these operations. And then with some um, historical odor emission rates, it estimates the dispersion and then the impact of those odors downwind. Generally, the output from these tools are odor annoyance free frequency distances or separation distances for particular levels of odor annoyance. With step four, um, based on, uh, on the assessment of what air quality is or, or could be for a given facility, the last step is developing effective and applicable control techniques. And uh, I think applicable is important here too. As part of this step, there is, um, is where we need to do our homework and evaluate the source of the proof or control technologies. We need to consider whether something has been tested at lab or full scale and how that effectiveness was evaluated as well. If there is, um, if you are approached about um, some new techniques, for example, there I think that it's important and you should be willing to ask about on-farm testing opportunities. Um, Companies are often looking for these opportunities to test on farm, um, but it shouldn't be at, um, there needs to be some cost benefit to everybody. When it comes to then selecting emission control approaches, um, first and foremost, you know, siting and appropriate management, common sense and courtesy can go <laughs> a, a very long way before we even start to look at all of the numerous control approaches that are out there. As we look into emission control, whether it's odor or gas or particulate emission, um, there's different ways to, to group these emission control approaches. The way I like to look at it are um, considering emission control approaches that reduce generation. 
reduce generation from that source and generally that source is the manure. Second, there are control approaches that reduce emissions or that transfer of gas from the, from the barn, from the area to the surroundings. And then there is increasing dispersion or once that air is emitted to the environment, how can you enhance its uh, dispersion and dilution within the environment? These emission control groups can also be applied to outdoor manure storages. Similarly, we wanna look at reducing generation, focusing on the source concentration or the manure source in general. But we can then look at reducing emissions and the transfer of gases from that manure into the air and then reducing, or excuse me, increasing dispersion. Really what we're gonna focus on in this um, presentation today is reducing generation and to a certain extent, reducing emissions right at that source of manure in the barn or outside of the barn. I do also wanna mention that there is a great, um, another great resource available that provides uh, snapshots of many of, well, all of the management practices I'm gonna to touch on today plus more. Again, it, it is a qualitative assessment, um, but it also considers um, the relative effectiveness of these different air management practices for ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, odor, and other gases. I think it's also important that it, it does a qualitative assessment of relative cost as well. And it, it has it broken down, these techniques developed broken down between manure storage and handling, um, excuse me, animal housing, manure storage and handling, and land application. For today though, the way that we're gonna move into some more air emission control approaches and some of the options available is I'm gonna present them on what I'm calling the manure spectrum. The manure spectrum is uh, what I see as the, the flow of nutrients, the flow of components from uh, initially generally in the feed, can be from other sources, but a lot of that comes from the feed, goes into the animal, which is then into the manure. Once um, once that we have the manure, we have opportunity to change the composition of that manure. And then the next step is reducing that gas transfer to air. So I've grouped the, the emission control approaches that are generally in that reducing generation or reducing emissions um, in those groups. And I've, I've, I'm gonna present them along this spectrum. So we're gonna start on the left side of the spectrum with feed. So I, I don't think uh, this one is gonna be a large surprise to, to those on the call today, but of course with diet modification, uh, we can influence what first enters this manure spectrum. There's phase and split, split, excuse me, split sex feeding, uh, different ways to improve nutrient absorption, changing urine and feces composition. Uh, way back when, when I was a grad student, one of the projects um, that was in tandem with some of my research was a sugar beet pulp based meal, uh, sugar beet, sugar beet pulp, excuse me, feed for pigs. And um, as part of that study, there was a significant change in distribution of nitrogen between the fecal material and the urine. And those two different components of our manure have some have different properties and different air quality um, impacts. And so just an example with some diet modifications. Of course, with any diet modification, and this is coming from an engineer, <laughs> right? We have variable feed cost effects and, um, uh, excuse me, feed cost effects. With these diet modifications, generally what we're trying to do is change the manure composition. But in, in that sense, we're also often changing the manure value or the amount of nutrients we have, concentration of nutrients we have in that manure. More and more so, we're he hearing that this manure, or um, it's becoming better recognized, excuse me, of this, the value of the manure as a source of nutrients. And in some cases, there's, um, there's a pushback at trying to reduce that nutrient composition of that manure. And so these changes that we make at the diet end, at the feed end of manure, um, have potential for a lot of impact because they are really at the start of the spectrum and any changes we make here can be reflected throughout.
Once we have uh, the manure, we can also then look at options to change the composition of that manure. There are, of course, numerous manure additives out there on the market. They have different modes of action, it might be microbial, enzymatic, or digestive, adsorbents or absorbents, or chemical in nature. With manure additives, um, in most cases, the manure, uh, the, we have um, quite a bit of data uh, of manure additives that's done at a lab or a pilot scale, often in reactors. There was a recent 2020 data set generated for 12 commercial products in swine manure, and it included uh, manure composition, gas, and odor levels. And so uh, every, every additive um, has its specific mode of action and can have specific results uh, in a reactor setting. Um, and so there are some, there is some different data out there, but the number of full scale studies we have for manure additives comparing at the full scale barn level, what the differences are between or with or without an additive, it is fairly limited. And so we do need to tread carefully when looking at, at additives. My general, um, my general recommendation is that if you find an additive that works with your manure that seems to work with the biology of the manure, that's great. It works for you. Um, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be a promise that it's gonna work for your neighbor. But um, if it's something is working for you, if something is changing the manure in a way that works for you and your system, that's good. Manure additives are generally easy to implement, and I, I, they're almost like a band-aid solution in many cases because we can apply them uh, when they're when needed. They're usually easy to implement, easy to apply. That being said, they might need repeated applications to keep their effectiveness. And that effectiveness is highly variable because of that um, uh, variable nature of our manure to begin with. Other ways that we can change the uh, composition of our manure, get, get more at the heart of that organic content of the manure. Anaerobic digestion, I don't think is a new uh, concept to anybody on the call here today, um, but sometimes taking a step back, recognizing what that digestion process is or why it can or cannot, why it can promote odor or help reduce odor um, is important to recognize. Anaerobic digestion is the breakdown of our, of our organic matter or carbons in the manure. So it's taking those volatile solids and through a two-step process, converting them ideally to methane, carbon dioxide, water, and other trace gases. This is the concept of anaerobic digesters, um, but it's also the concept that happens in just simply stored liquid manure or anywhere where we have anaerobic digestion. Digesters can help control this process so that we can keep the acid-forming bacteria in sync with the methane-forming bacteria. Um, if we're not trying to manage those two bacteria together, uh, we can get an overabundance of volatile organic acids, and that is really what contributes to the odor when we have the breakdown of manure. <coughs> if we, so again, anaerobic digestion is a conversion of manure. It's taking manure and converting that, that, the organic portion of it. It's a treatment process and has potential to produce odor, but has also potential to reduce odor if we can manage it properly. I'm not going to go into all the different formats of anaerobic digesters that are available. Um, I wanted to focus more on the concept of how this odor or how odor relates to anaerobic digestion. Because anaerobic digestion has a lot of other considerations to take into account. There, um, there is opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through digestion or through that digestion process. <coughs> digestion um, is not typically a does not typically result in a change in the amount or the volume of manure nutrients, but it is a change in the form of those manure nutrients. The process is very sensitive, as I outlined in the previous graph. It's a really a balancing act, a microbial balancing act. And when we go into managed digestion, the installation and operation costs can be high. There are programs to offset these costs for anaerobic digestion. And um, this is one example of, uh, of a set of programs that tends to ebb and flow or has been ebbing and flowing at least over my career. 
where, where anaerobic digestion was the conversion of that manure organic material into other products in the absence of oxygen, composting is similarly a conversion of the organic material and manure to other, other products with the presence of oxygen. So with, sol, uh, with composting, we have some raw product, which may include car well, it does include carbon and nitrogen and minerals and, and a lot of water as part of that manure. Um, even if it's a solid, it's still a lot of water. And then there can be, of course, microbes and pathogens in that manure. With composting or active composting in the right conditions and with oxygen, um, the process results in a loss of water, loss of heat, and a loss of carbon dioxide. And that loss of water, heat, and carbon dioxide is uh, represents that conversion of organic matter into the end product of organic matter, um, some organic matter, but also minerals and water and microorganisms. Uh, there are different stages to composting, and it requires also a, um, a careful balancing act. Composting is a managed process. Composting isn't just simply stockpiling manure. Um, but composting is creating the, the right recipe of um, nitrogen and carbon materials, um, manure being a heavy form of the nitrogen and, and usually some other um, bedding or other carbon rich materials being the, uh, the mixing or the, the other substrate for composting. And then making sure that there is um, appropriate porosity and moisture to keep this process going. So similar to um, digestion, you know, we have um, changes in manure nutrient forms uh, through this composting process where um, we can lose some nitrogen um, to ammonia loss, um, but it's com composting is really about the conversion of that organic matter or the breakdown of that organic matter. There is a change in mass and volume, primarily from that loss of water through composting and similar to anaerobic digestion that is sensitive to, to management. So aeration is um, what I look at as uh, composting in a liquid environment. And we have um, in, uh, in a liquid manure storage system, it's very hard for oxygen to get into that manure, um, to reach aerobic microbes that convert organic matter to um, carbon dioxide and water. If those, if that organic matter um, does not have, or if those, if there's not sufficient or oxygen present, it's really the anaerobic microbes that are gonna take over within that liquid manure and produce odorous compounds. And so what aeration is, attempts to do is to bring oxygen um, and promote aerobic breakdown of that manure and reduce the amount of odorous compounds that are produced in that process. Now, how that oxygen is introduced into the manure can be done in a variety of different ways. Uh, it can be a pneumatic system, it could be a mechanical system with a propeller, for example. Um, either way, what, uh, what has probably been one of the biggest hindrances to aeration is just the amount of energy that it takes to deliver that power to keep that manure um, moving to keep that oxygen flowing through the manure. Aeration can be very effective for odors, um, but because of that energy intensity and also that our change in seasons and our winter conditions that can affect the operation, um, it's, been, it's been challenging to see aeration systems work very um, over multiple years. Um, they, they do have a lot of short-term benefits and I think our biggest challenge is making sure or getting to a system that will last many years in a, in a challenging environment that is our manure storages. This is also one of those systems that um, is only really for outdoor manure storages. We haven't seen aeration uh, implemented inside in many, in, I, I don't have any instances coming immediately to mind and so this is for an outdoor manure storage. With aeration, because of that breakdown of organic matter, there is still going to be some uh, solid material left over and sludge does develop in an aeration system, similar to an anaerobic lagoon um, that we see primarily uh, further south of us. Aeration also results in, in a sludge that would need to be managed or removed 
periodically. Solid and liquid separation is another way that we can change the composition of the manure. At the beginning of this meeting, um, one of our sponsors shared videos of some, uh, some treatment processes that included solid liquid separation. And so whatever the separation process might be, the, the, the objective is to create multiple streams. And typically that's gonna be a liquid stream and a solid portion. And because of just our inherent nature of what is in urine, what is in feces, what's the breakdown or what's the composition, what are the form of nutrients in those two streams, what we typically see in the liquid portion is with those reduced solids, we um, can see some higher nitrogen or more concentrated nitrogen and lower phosphorus and reduced organic matter. Um, and then within the solid portion, uh, lower nitrogen or at least lower volatile nitrogen and higher phosphorus and higher organic matter. Now with these, um, <clears throat> with solid liquid separation, you do end up with multiple manure streams, which can be, can be beneficial if you have uses for those various streams or you have um, means to use those different streams because um, they both need to be handled. You both, they both need to be either removed um, effectively and efficiently or reused. Um, composition is going to affect the hauling in the land application. Um, if it's uh, liquid enough or low, sol low enough solids, there are irrigation options with a, a liquid stream that has more and more solids removed. Again, with any system, there are installation and operation costs um, to overcome. And sometimes though these different manure streams, these different use options can help in that uh, overcome or the benefit cost ratio, cost benefit ratio becomes amenable. <coughs> When we, we have our manure, we've or we fed, uh, fed our animals, we've generated manure, and we may or may not have changed the composition of that manure um, prior to storage. Even at that point, there are some ways that we can reduce gas transfer to air at the manure. And when it comes to our manure storage, there are different options for covers. There are impermeable covers, uh, geotextile covers, and there can also be some natural covers made of either straw or a natural crust. The concept though, with any of these covers is that it is a barrier between the manure surface and the air. Impermeable, um, relative to these other four or other three that are shown, impermeable would not let, will not let water through that cover, whereas the other ones will allow water in through the cover. And so precipitation and how precipitation can or should be handled uh, and how that precipitation can or will affect the ultimate manure is a consideration when you're looking at covers. Um, manure agitation and pumping, when you add either extra material, whether it's straw or, or have a lot of um, solid material on top, um, or if you have that cover that needs to be pulled back for agitation and pumping, that's just, that's a consideration in understanding how you want to handle that. Uh, covers, at least for the synthetic covers, there is an installation and operation cost. But one of the other components to consider is gas generation, whether it's intended or um, intended for use or not. The covers that I showed in the previous slide, for example, in permeable, can go hand in hand with an anaerobic digester system where we have gas capture under a cover such as this and we can capture it and treat or capture that gas and use it for different purposes. But um, there is going to be some gas generation and how that'll affect your cover needs to be considered. Finally, um, we have manure. And as I mentioned at the beginning, when we land apply manure, that is again, another source for odors and other sources for, source for gas release. We have different application techniques, but I don't think that they've, I don't feel that they've changed uh, a very significant amount in recent uh, in recent years. We have injection, we have incorporation. Um, I'm not gonna go into too many details of this. I feel that this is um, fairly widespread practice or fairly well-known practice um, for protecting or reducing air emissions. We, injection and incorporation are promoted um, for nutrient retention and getting those nutrients below the surface and that ties into air quality. We can get those nutrients below the surface and prevent emission. Um, those nutrients have can do some more use in the soil for a growing crop than they can going into the air. 
So timing is really everything when it comes to air quality and addressing manure odors at the source. Um, timing, we can look at, are we in the planning or the building or the operating or renovating stage of a site? Um, because some of these systems are easier to incorporate earlier in the process, whereas other systems um, have, can be applied later in uh, as maybe a band-aid or a solution to an existing air quality problem or issue. Emission control um, really benefits from assessment and planning right from the start. We have these different technologies at our fingertips. Um, we, have, we know some of the pros and cons to all of them, but really taking a step back, understanding what it is that we want to address, what are the air quality issues that we want to address and making sure that addressing them at the manure is the right place um, can benefit from some more assessment and planning approaches. Emission control approaches at the animal feed or the storage stage have impacts down the manure spectrum. The further to the left we can start of that manure spectrum, um, the more chances we have of improving air quality at the storage stage or at the land application stage or before emission stage. Now, when it comes to air quality, there's a lot of important information that I really simply couldn't cover today in, in the time constraints that we had. I focused on those air emission, um, air, air quality, um, address, I, I tried to address manure, enter, manure uh, odors at the source. There are, uh, are, there are options out there for cleaning the air or filtering the air that leaves our farms or disperses from our farms. So I didn't go into all of those, but again, I would um, recommend you look at the air management practices assessment tool from Iowa State University to get a, um, a broad view of what some of those options are. I also did not go into manure gas safety today, um, particularly manure um, hydrogen sulfide or methane that's associated with manure storage. Um, but I do encourage everybody to be safe and recognize what are some of the risks when it comes to manure management. I do have a series of resources um, as part of my slide set, um, air management practices assessment tool, as I mentioned, the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Community has a, a, a lot of different resources from across the country on not only air quality, but also just manure management in general. A lot of the material that I referenced today was from a fact sheet uh, on airborne emission management, on airborne emission management that is on the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Community. And then there was the NACSAP tool as well. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts as part of the Midwest Manure Summit this year. Um, I feel free to reach out if you do want to continue the conversation or I can't get to your questions in the time remaining today. Appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cordes. Um, if anybody has questions, do feel free to drop them in the chat. I don't think that I've seen anything come through quite yet. Um, we'll give everybody just a, another minute to see if there's a question that comes through, but we do appreciate you um, taking the time to be here with us today um, for that uh, great presentation. <laughs>